Good afternoon and welcome to the April Smart Grid Educational Series webinar with a seminar hosted by TV, TUV Rhineland here in Pleasanton, California. We are extremely grateful to Matthias and to Gary here for hosting us in Pleasanton and we hope that this will be informative for all of you. Uh, today we are going to be talking about two topics which are part of the evolution, if you may, of smart grid technologies. We have been doing a lot of presentations that deal with policy and we deal with technology, but today we are going to be looking at two different aspects that are a little further down in the development and maturity of this industry. So the first one is going to be on testing and certification. A lot has been made about the interoperability of smart grid technologies, and the reason is because we don't want to have a single vendor lock-in situation. If you're a utility or if you're an aggregator or any service provider, you want to have the flexibility to have multiple vendors' technologies interoperate. But how do you ensure interoperability unless you have adherence to standards? And when I say adherence to standards, I'm not talking about just giving lip service saying I'm compliant with such and such standard, and by the way, I am self-certified. That method has shown not to work too well. So the next level of evolution here is that once a technology matures to a certain level, it's important for us to have standards that vendors will comply with and have independent parties organizations like TUV Rhineland that would go detail spec by spec within the standard and make sure that the technology follows that those specifications and it is proven in a real lab. With that kind of confidence, then utilities and aggregators and other service providers can procure technologies from such certified products and expect interoperability between them in an environment. So today we are going to hear from Gary about what some of the things that TUV Rhineland is doing, especially in the area of Smart Energy Profile 2.0. And then the next presentation is going to be by two people from the SunSpec Alliance who are going to talk a little bit about the securitization of solar assets. Now, solar technology has been deployed for many, many years in different forms. But now with the advent of moving away from centralized power plants to a distributed energy resource architecture uh, for the electric utility industry, solar power is no longer this thing that technology connoisseurs or just energy conscious people are going to have. This has to become part of the mainstay in generating electricity in the future. And therefore, the proper financial instruments and financial mechanisms need to be in place in order to enable this technology on a large scale. And we're going to hear today from our guests who are going to talk to us a little bit about how that can be made possible. So with that, I'm going to now ask Gary to come and speak a little bit about TUV Rhineland and what they're doing in this area of testing and certification. So, Gary? Thank you, Irfan. And I wish to thank everyone for showing up here. We have a room full of impressive people. And thank you all online, ladies and gentlemen, for joining. I'm not going to take too much time because I want to get ahead with the second presentation about the, um, the marketplace. But I do want to introduce TUV Rhineland, as we will be hosting many of Irfan's up-and-coming seminars, both from our Smart Grid Lab here in Pleasanton, California, and our soon-to-be-opened Irvine, California uh, facility. <clears throat> TUV, um, Testing und Verification, it stands for, has been in business 140 years, German-based out of Cologne. And there are many aspects of the of the organization, from testing automobiles, from crash testing Mercedes, to doing pharmaceuticals and medical equipment, to fabrics and children's toys. But I'm skipping all of that today because of the time budget. Plus, I want to uh, just 
talk about the electrical testing sector in relation to our smart grid. Let's see here. Um, well, the last thing we all need is a definition of the smart grid, but I think the real thing we do need is a definition of the smart grid. The smart grid, of course, is communication over the power utility sector. The important part here is at the bottom where we have smart electricity plus smart water and smart gas equaling smart energy. So TUV is committed to the smart energy sector. A lot of what we do in the utility sector can be rubber stamped to the gas and the water sector for the metering of gas and water. The um, smart grid lab is interleaved throughout our assets of anacollectic chambers and, and testing equipment, millions of dollars worth of an investment. But um, we interleave it with the other ANSI C12 uh, meter testing for calibration and certification. Uh, we do environmental, of course, with um, functionality. So once we get to calibration and once we get to certification for compliance, we get into interoperability. And interoperability provides the starting block for cybersecurity. Uh, many of the uh, standard body organizations and alliances on the left are people we work with, and some of the up-and-coming areas of our development are on the right, such as um, uh, our quadrant reports, which will be emerging soon, and our work with uh, NERC and uh, the maturity models of cybersecurity. Some of the industry alliances we're generally working with include the Smart Grid Interoperability Panel, the Zigbee Alliance. We are the Consumer Electronic Association's test lab. We work with the Wi-Fi. We're certified for their compliance and others, as you see here. SunSpec, of course, sitting next to me. Can't go without saying that. Um, the key organizations we deal with are, um, we sit on the NIST SGIP panels, we work with the IEEE, we work with EPRI, we work with um, other alliances as, and organizations, standard body organizations. Um, these are a list of some alliances that we're working with. I don't mean to go quickly, but these are all very common for many, um, many of the background activities for test labs throughout the country. Um, I might add, that having the Wi-Fi Alliance certification plus the Zigbee Alliance puts TUV in a prime pole position for becoming what they call the CSEP 2.0 or CSEP 2.0. It's the Consortium for Smart Energy Profile, which is a ubiquitous transport of the um, command set over wireless, such as uh, Zigbee protocol or TCP IP for Ethernet or TCP IP over wireless, as well as Powerline. Um, MultiSpeak is an emerging standard. We're working with them on their interoperability. They're a part of a development with the National Rural Electric Co-op Association. Uh, on the SGIP, we're, we just signed on as a member for the SGIP 2.0, which is now a privatized organization, and it's picking up the activity of the 1.0, which we've been a part of for the past half a dozen years. Um, one of the work groups is called the SG for Smart Grid Testing and Certification Committee. This is a group within the SGIP standardizing many of the interoperability. Um, this is one of my favorites, the Home to Grid work group, headed by Dr. Kenneth Wax. Uh, Ken has done an excellent job uh, fostering the demand response uh, world and bringing in the uh, modular communication interface, shown here as the CEAR 7.8 specification. When a lab such as TUV starts its testing, the first two items we test are specification compliance as well as functionality. Does the machine drop temperature two degrees when told to, or, or um, are the functions of the device accurate? From there, we go into the interoperability of that, how they work well with other dissimilar manufacturers. And then that brings us to the cybersecurity 
And with cybersecurity, I always found it interesting that there are three levels. One is just malicious data, such as some kid wanting to change the meter rate from $2 to $200 or vice versa. And then you have targeted attacks, such as denial of service, people that want to throw a monkey wrench into the machinery. However, the worst case is kinetic damage to grid assets, and this is cyber warfare. Uh, there was an incident where we did something perhaps to a group of centrifuges somewhere that caused some malicious damage. And, and these are the uh, aspects. I think the new James Bond movie had a scene where an iPhone sent in a phase of a, um, of a um, substation at the, at the wrong time and blew it up for kinetic damage. Right, Jerry? I think so. You don't get out much. Okay. These are the emerging standards of cybersecurity. The Department of Homeland Security, along with the White House and NIST, they're doing a electric, electric, electricity subsector cybersecurity capability maturity model called the ESC2M2. Uh, now, interop is, in fact, something that Irfan pointed out and the most necessary aspect of a truly objective third-party test lab can only do because we have no skin in the game for anybody's particular product. We're not making money on sales, but we are just testing the interoperability. And the more interop testing that is done prior to the deployment, the less surprises we get in the field, the happier the customers, and um, the better the, uh, the industry progresses. For example, this is one of our reports. This is completely hypothetical data just illustrating the report. And if you imagine an X and a Y axis, what's up in the top right best category would be uh, some thermostats or PCTs that work best with the bottom left quadrant, which is an open way um, meter. And you see some failing due to functionality and some failing due to interrupt. Then if you were to put a utility second meter in here, the top right quadrant would be less because some would not work with the second one. So eventually, like a three-dimensional tic-tac-toe, you can use these reports to, um, to find out the effect of our testing, how it will be deployed in the real world. This knowledge is invaluable. One of my favorite quotes is from a Dr. Negroponte from MIT. Items that are temporary or portable should be wireless. Items which are fixed and permanent should be wireline connected. For example, a refrigerator isn't going to move. Putting a Zigbee module in a refrigerator is not an elegant use of technology. However, a laptop, computer, or uh, portable equipment or temporary applications should be wireless. So the only way to prove that you get whole home coverage is by a hybrid approach of both power line and wireline connectivity. Here, for example, is a photo of me taken at the CEA in the middle, and to my right is Bob Hiley of the, of the um, Zigbee Alliance, and to my left is um, Robert Rank of the Home Plug Alliance. So um, basically, you put these guys together and you get the whole home coverage. And that brings us to the end of the presentation. And um, I thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much, Gary. And at this point, I'm going to move to the SunSpec. Now, Tom Tansy here, one of the co-founders of the SunSpec Alliance, is going to talk about the securitization of solar assets. And um, I had an opportunity to speak a little bit with Tom here uh, during lunch, and I'm looking forward to a very informative presentation. So, Tom. Thank you very much, Ravon. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone here in the room and, and there in the internet. As Irfan mentioned, my name is Tom Tanzi. I'm the chairman of the SunSpec Alliance, and I also run marketing and business development for that organization. 
Uh, the SunSpec Alliance is about four years old now, and so we got started as uh, to fill a need for information standardizations in the solar industry. So my partner, John Nunley, and I were working for a monitoring company at that time and found ourselves developing lots of device drivers to interface with meters and with inverters and so forth. And we felt that there needed to be a, a better way to, to handle that particular problem. And so that was sort of the genesis of the SunSpec Alliance. Uh, in, in a few moments, I'll take you through a quick presentation of the SunSpec Alliance to give you a little bit of a background about how we approach the marketplace and the technology and how this applies to the area of financing solar assets through securitization. We've recently been hired by the National Renewable Energy Lab to support a project uh, that is uh, uh, initiated by NREL uh, called the Solar Access to Public Capital Initiative, SAPC. And so the Solar Access to Public Capital Initiative uh, it, it deals with raising capital through securitization in the marketplace in order to support securitization you need to assess risks. One of the risks is r risk of solar performance. And so that's where the SunSpec Alliance comes into play is to measure that risk of operational power plants. Now that I've stolen all of my thunder, I'll actually get onto the presentation here. Okay, so again, the, the project background for our initiative is part of Solar Access Public Capital. This is a, an actually a very, very well supported initiative with PV industry, bankers, and rating agencies all participating very broadly. So uh, all the biggest banks from Deutsche Bank and Rabobank Bank and Bank of America and Wells Fargo, et cetera, the major ratings agencies, uh, Standard & Poor's, of course, uh, Fitch, Moody's, et cetera, are uh, very firmly involved, as well as the major suppliers and fleet operators. And so as a result, I think that it has a very good chance of, of taking all. The, the goal of the SAPC is to enable securitization. So what is securitization? So very simply, securitization has to do with the unbundling of the assets and those purchase or those contracts to guarantee to pay uh, a fee for service over a long period of time. So the idea is that these contracts are separated. In the case of a, of a solar deal, they're typically 20-year contracts. And so in other words, there's 240 payments to be made over time. So these contracts get bundled together, special purpose vehicle, a company is issued, and uh, a bond uh, is, is then put out on the stock market. So the idea is to trade a large amount of capital up front for this obligation to perform over a long period of time. This allows the industry to bring in uh, big chunks of capital, which then allows us to build out the solar fleet. In order for securitization to work, risks need to be properly assessed. And in the case of securitization of the solar asset, there are two main elements of risks. Uh, by, by far, the largest component is energy optaker risk. That's the credit risk of the individual who's agreed to pay this contract for 240 periods over time. The second area of risk is plant performance. You know, will the asset actually perform during the time of this contract? If it doesn't perform over the time of the contract, of course, the buyer's motivation to make good on that contract can lessen. So it actually has a double whammy. You're under, both underperforming from an energy standpoint and also making uh, the overall situation riskier as it pertains to the, the credit holder in this case. So to mitigate the risk on the performance side, SunSpec was appointed to establish an actuarial database of solar plant performance incorporating a, a fleet that spans the United States. So our objective is to have 100% penetration and have all these power plants from residential plants to commercial industrial to utility plants, of course, reporting in actuarial data so that we can categorically prove that the technology works over this long period of time and that, therefore, solar is a safe investment. Okay. Quick overview of the SunSpec Alliance. As I mentioned, we got started about four years ago. We have 60 members in our ranks. These are all fierce competitors, but we also collaborate. We collaborate in the area of information and communication standards. Uh, so we've worked very hard to define open de facto communication standards that, of course, are very much informed by international standards. And you'll see some of that as we go here. De facto standards, they, they fill a role in the marketplace to get the marketplace on its feet 
and to drive to a maturity level. At some point, of course, you want international standards to come in and take over as we move to scale. So we have lots of really great engineers on our team. These are some of the members uh, in our organization, and it really is kind of a who's who. We have great representation out of the uh, inverter space, of course, and in metering, uh, and actually in fleet development and so forth. Uh, so again, very broad coalition of partners here, and our one of our main target audiences, of course, are the software engineers that work for these companies. These tend to be a relatively rare, rare breed, if you will, and what are largely hardware companies. And so uh, we, we offer an opportunity for these individuals to get together, uh, define common problems, and come up with common solutions. To give you a perspective of what standardization means from SunSpec's point of view, we have this architecture slide here. The architecture is a logical depiction of a solar power plant, which you see primarily on the left-hand side of the screen, and the information architecture that it interacts with on the right-hand side of the screen. SunSpec has defined specifications and standards for all the elements that you see colored in, arrow, in, in uh, orange. So starting on the left-hand side, we offer information models, which are a logical description of inverters, string combiners, meters, et cetera. You, you can read the list yourself. Most recently, we've added in the control element. Uh, at the first pass, it was a one-way communication with a monitoring interface. Now, as the marketplace is maturing, there's a need for control, and so we're adding a control interface as well. We've defined specifications as well for aggregating information on a solar power plant at the logging level and then transporting it securely over the internet to a data store, and then expressing that information to applications. So the, the topic that we're discussing today, securitization, of course, relies on all these standards, but in particular, the one in the upper right-hand corner, which is a SunSpec plant extract document uh, a specification. So this is a so-called envelope specification. In other words, it's a, it provides a, a method for describing a power plant and then pouring time series data into that envelope. So you get all the metadata about the power plant and the time series inf information. Now there are many different use cases for the plant extract document specification. One we call operational continuity, simply moving a plant from one monitoring or managing system to another by providing a backup function. Another use case, of course, is for financial reporting, and that's the topic today for securitization. In that case, you have different needs, different data needs. In the case of securitization, you also have the need for data privacy to protect the homeowners, for example. Uh, all these things are, are possible within the context of a standard interface in this plant extract document. Um, I also want to, to mention, because I know we have a large number of people that are involved in the smart grid, about to, the fact that we're both informed by smart grid standards and then, of course, feed into them. So uh, smart energy profile 2.0, which has come up several times here, the inverter interface to smart energy profile 2.0 is, in fact, SunSpec inverter specification. The SunSpec inverter specification, in turn, was informed by some work done by IEC 61850. So we've taken that uh, information model, we've flattened it, we've applied it in the Modbus realm with SunSpec. And so you have a, a data value integrity from 61850 through Smart Energy Profile uh, integrated by the SunSpec Alliance inverter interface. So the, the main point there is that we view our, our role in this business as uh, offering a, a catalytic uh, services to enable the, the marketplace to grow. We choose not to reinvent the wheel. Therefore, you'll see, especially in the uh, application domain, the network domain, that we certainly use common internet protocols and adopt best practices as a way forth to, to drive that innovation and establish a level playing field. So standards, why standards? Really simple. You, if you can agree on, on things that are non-differentiating for you as a, uh, as a company, what a standard gives you is the ability to drive out cost, to drive out complexity by simply adopting something that we can all agree on, which is a need to communicate with one another. You drive out risk, of course. Now, coincident with that, of relieving yourself of doing a job that where you can add relatively little value, that frees up cycles to add value in what you're good at, 
which then allows innovation to occur, which ultimately leads to higher performance. And so that's certainly the value of standards in almost any realm, and that is the case here as well. Okay, now with that as a background, we'll talk about solar securitization. And in particular, this project that SunSpec has been hired to do called the Open Solar Performance and Reliability Clearinghouse, also known as OSPARC. So as we were hired by NREL, we were given a series of objectives to attain. Uh, the number one objective is to create a, a method, a reason for partners to talk with one another and exchange information. We talk about establishing a construct for information exchange. Why should I turn information over to you? We'll explain that in a moment. The key constituents here, of course, are the plant owners. These are the ones either that are managing the fleets or would like to build more fleets of plants. The banks, of course, that control the money that allow those fleets to be built. And then the service providers in between that facilitate that sort of a transaction. Coincident with that activity, next up in terms of our objectives is to define key metrics for risk assessment. And this boils down to really three, three areas. One is defining what are those critical measurements and uh, the accent on the word measurement there. We've, we're talking about uh, things that we can observe and uh, operating on information that has not been manipulated in, in any way. So establish those, those key measurements and then establish a rating system associated therewith. Key performance indicators are typically comparisons of two measured values. So defining what those are and putting them in a data dictionary so that we're, we can all talk about the same thing when we talk about performance ratio, for example. Uh, this, this is a, a topic in the solar industry that, that, depending upon where you go, you, you may have 20 or 30 different definitions. So coming up and leveling the playing field on, on what performance ratio is and the various flavors of it, again, another key, uh, key objective. And then next up, establishing quality factors. In the solar marketplace today, a, a large amount of the fleet, of course, is monitored, but the, the monitoring that takes place is highly variable. It's done by many different types of uh, service providers, and sometimes they collect the same information, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they use low-quality instruments, sometimes they use high-quality instruments. Now, the fact that you have varying quality here means that you have uncertainty in your measurement. So establishing what quality actually means as it comes to measurement is another uh, objective for us. Now, with that sort of a background done, then we need to build out this database of plants that gets distributed by geography and then provide access to the database by the financial industry that wishes to put together these securitization deals, ultimately to, uh, to establish confidence in solar as an asset class and then enable the uh, creation of financing vehicles. All right, so this construct for information exchange Actually, when you boil it down, it's really quite simple. On the one hand, you have plant owners and operators that are looking to finance their next deal. They're, they go to the banks to ask for, for money. The bank says, sure, I'll lend to you, but since I don't know uh, how well your plants are going to produce, I'm going to charge you a higher rate. Operator comes back and says, well, how about if I can prove to you how these plants work? It's like, fine, if you provide the information to me showing how plants work, I'll provide you capital at favorable rates. So that's the main objective here in terms of establishing this contract between the buyer and seller, in this case the bank with the money, the plant operator, fleet operator with the desire to build more plants. The information suppliers in between, of course, they service these, their, their customers and, uh, and they, they come along for the ride to support them in this endeavor. Everybody's happy because you end up with a bigger solar market. Okay, so now what is this sort of information that you want to rely on to make a financing decision? So here we look to the IEC 61724 standard, which defines how to categorically uh, define the output of a solar power plant. So it's, it's uh, sunlight in minus any parasitic losses or contributions from other sources and with AC power out to the grid. So this picture should be good news for people that manufacture meters because each one of these points needs to be measured, all right? You know, which is a best practice that is not widely uh, adopted at this point, but uh, is an area of future opportunity. Uh, but this is ultimately how you determine how much is a uh, power plant uh, pushing out to the grid. The database that we're building, the OSPARC database, Open Solar Performance and Reliability Clearinghouse, uh, is depicted here. 
this is a conceptual diagram. Then on the left-hand side, these are showing operational power plants that are monitored by some third party or uh, first party monitoring system. And they're collecting raw telemetry that's being used for operational purposes. So that information stays within the domain of the plant. Now, once a day, what will happen is these plant databases will produce a periodic report uh, with containing one hour values. This is what the industry seems to uh, uh, be, set, be settling on as a requirement for this type of financial application. That periodic report is anonymized, pushed into the database. <clears throat> the, the database is then made available to financiers who can run queries, and I'll show you what a query looks like. They get back an anonymized report. So a typical query would be, hey, I'm thinking of building a fleet in the state of New Mexico, okay? And it's gonna be plants that, that will be between uh, 100 and 500 kW in size, for example. So, uh, uh, and located at a certain elevation, perhaps. So run a query that says, for this particular Latin long or this area, uh, get me back all similar plants, right? And so that, and then that list comes back showing how these plants are, are indexed and rated one, one against the other while being anonymized, okay? So that's the report side. Now, the administrative interface is used to fill in any of the data that wasn't already generated by the plant. So for example, if you have additional information uh, about uh, ownership, uh, O&M people change in the plant, uh, various aspects of title may change, so we offer an administrative interface for that. And then finally, an auditing interface. Because at the end of the day, in order for the system to be trusted, you need to verify that it was you know, collecting the, uh, the values at, at properly. And so that's what we do, and it operates continuously. It's intended to work over a long period of time. This project is funded for a period of about three years, and then beyond that, uh, uh, we'll see. But the idea is to create a, a system that is general use to the finance of the solar industry. Okay, so after collecting this data over a long period of time, of course, the financier runs a query. That query ends up putting the information in on, on a scale where essentially you have the ability to sort plants based upon how well they perform and how reliable are they over time. That's the uh, horizontal axis. The vertical axis is what type of confidence do we have in the data. Right? So what this allows you to do is say, well, the, the plants in the upper right-hand quadrant, they have observed the best practices for data collection and accuracy. They also perform the best. These are the ones that I'm, I'm most interested in. Right? So over time, the idea with this type of transparency is you drive most plants up and to the right as the quality of the data gets higher and the scrutiny on the information becomes greater. Uh, performance typically improves. That's the uncertainty we're talking about. That's the uncertainty, right. So the measuring confidence, that has to do with the uncertainty, exactly. Okay. Now, details, right? So I ultimately could present 20 pages worth of details here, but I won't. So I'll give you some of the high points. Uh, now, our pro we have a very open process, and particularly with the OSPARC project. We operate in a public forum, so we're actively seeking input. So for example, one part of uh, describing a plant is you have the plant metadata, so that has a u unique identifier. It's got a common name, it has a location, it has a list of service providers that are associated with it. It has dates that various things happen, either when the plant was built or when it was commissioned and so forth. All these are important, and, and the, all, any uh, value here, of course, would be queryable. You also have information about the array and the plant design. Uh, these are all uh, key measurements, if you will, that are later uh, used in, in uh, metrics. Similarly, you have static information about the device, make, model, serial number, et cetera. All right. Beyond the device information, now we have the key measurements. Now, here's where we have many, many pages of key measurements, so I've just given you a, an example of a few. At the plant level, we've identified the most common measurements that would be needed to make an investment de decision. And those, those important factors, of course, is how much resource do you have, how good is your performance relative your, to your resource, and how reliable is your plant. So from an investment decision-making process, that's what you need. A lot of the fine-grained detail, bankers aren't interested, therefore it's not included. Right, so availability and status. So, so here, we're actually borrowing from some work that was done in the wind industry to define these, these different uh, operational modes. Uh, again, very important for making an investment decision. 
you, you need to know, for example, the, the plant is is it is it healthy? Is it available to uh, to produce uh, energy? Yes. Okay. Is it daytime? Is sun shining? That's in full operating condition. If it's nighttime, it's in standby, still ready to work, uh, but the the, uh, the sun's down. Or perhaps an environmental condition happens. Cloud passes by. You pass a low threshold. Plant or part of the plant sh shuts off. The reason for that, I guess, is an environmental. So knowing this type of information is important to discerning is the plant operating properly or not. And at the, at the end of the day, all of these, this information that we collect drives these key performance indicators or, or the metrics. And here I've depicted what we believe are really sort of some of the most important uh, measurements from a uh, again, from an investment standpoint, and uh, I won't read them for you. And the, the presentation will be made available, and actually in long form. So for those that want to comment on this and say, "Hey, you missed something. You went too far here. Didn't go far enough in some other direction," uh, I'm certainly not only looking for, for welcome that feedback, but I'm, I'm looking for it. Okay. So we collect this data over time, and so what does query look like? Financer sits down, inputs a date range, right? You want to give us get a certain uh, vintage for your fleet, uh, feeds in location information, size range, et cetera. Out pops a list with plants like uh, the ones just described here in an anonymized report. Now, that anonymized report feeds back to you really indexing values. So how does this plant rate relative to its peers you know, given its environmental conditions? All right. So that's sort of a quick overview about what we do. So why should you be interested? Well, the reason you might be interested varies depending upon what job you do. If you're a project developer or a fleet operator, you should be interested in this project because what it means, it'll deliver access to capital at dramatically lower rates. Uh, the research that this project is based on indicates that maybe as much as 16% uh, of the levelized cost of energy could be saved through securitization. So that's why a project developer or a fleet operator should be interested. If you're an equipment manufacturer or a data custodian, it's really about differentiating the quality of your product or service. This allows the, the quality operators, the quality components to really shine. That's, again, reflected in your yield versus your environment and your reliability uh, metrics. And this, of course, then makes you more valuable to your customers, which are the fleet operators and and, and the like. And then finally, the solar industry as a whole, so this is energy off takers, uh, this is the common consumer. Well, what this securitization provides is an opportunity to dramatically scale up the amount of, of capital in the industry. So, for example, it looks like we could you know, potentially raise a, a trillion dollars in new capital into this marketplace over the next couple of years. This is based on uh, a worldwide market for solar that just recently eclipsed 100 billion. All right, so significant amount of capital, but again, made available uh, at, lower, uh, at lower cost because it's lower risk, right? Again, proving that these plants perform. So where has the project been? Where are we going? We came onto the scene at the end of uh, February. We met with stakeholders in New York in the week of March 5th through 7th. About 40 people were there with that list of investors and so forth that I mentioned. There's a conference call that happens once a month. Next one happens to be tomorrow morning between 10 and 12. And if you're interested to participate in that, I can provide you with uh, access information for that. Where the project is overall is that, of course, SunSpec is doing its part to build the actuarial database. But the other parts of securitization have to do with streamlining the legal agreements. So one of the main activities that's taking place right now is coming up with common standardized contracts for residential and for commercial, right? And so that, that, I think, will be a large part of the agenda tomorrow, that along with uh, collecting this data that we've been talking about. SunSpec's objective is to secure our first data sources by about March, May 15th, and we'll be finishing our requirements and then delivering a prototype and building it out come uh, the first part of July. So if you're interested, to speak with me, I'll provide my contact information. I uh, would love to get your input, and if you uh, have a, a source of data or if you're a fleet operator, uh, please talk to me and we'll get you enrolled in the SAPC initiative. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Tom. And as the people in the room and online start formulating their questions, I would like to start by asking you a few, okay? So the first question that I have is that there are many countries all over the world that have sun 300 plus days of the year. And the nice thing about living in the United States is that we have every possible kind of geography there is on this planet, even the moon. I think if you go to New Mexico, there are some areas that look like the lunar surface. So having this database in North America mm -hmm. and being able to create case studies that could pretty much fit most any country in the world, have you thought of creating a subscription-based model to take this from the public sector that it is currently in because mm -hmm. of the NREL funding mm -hmm. to the private sector. Oh, yes, of course. And, and that kind of goes without saying. Um, and, you know, SunSpec Alliance was hired by the U.S. National Renewable Energy Lab, and so therefore the scope of our work for this project is the U.S. But the SunSpec Alliance itself is about 50-50 between U.S. companies and those from Asia and Europe, and so we definitely have a, a, a global scope. And so even now, today, we are in the process of building out a global database. So, uh, you know, this is, like all things that the SunSpec Alliance does, we do things for the mutual benefit of our members, right, because we are a trade association, a trade alliance, and so what we're doing is you know, acting cooperatively on, on those activities where each one of us can make a little bit of contribution, but we can't push it very far unless we team up together. And so, yes, that, that, that is clearly the long-term objective to offer this as a general service so that this type of financing can be done anywhere. Yeah, I'm thinking about like a professional services kind of, and maybe the not-for-profit status of mm -hmm. SunSpec Alliance may not be the right mm -hmm. business structure to do this in, but I can see an opportunity here for a professional services entity that would leverage the data here and meet with countries that have an appetite for solar technology mm -hmm. and use the database to create case studies for those countries and show the potential for solar power and what kind of potential financial risk they're going to be taking by implementing it so that they can make calculated risks. Absolutely, Irfan. And it, you know, I mentioned the, the, the fact that the information is, is searchable in, in various ways. And so one could well imagine uh, an operator in India that knows what that environment looks like very well, how hot it gets, how much the wind blows, et cetera, and make a, a query parameter like that, right? Give me a, a, a geographic environment that sort of looks like this and, and tell me, you know, where in the world we have something operating similarly. And so that, therefore, how can I expect uh, these assets to perform when I get them in the ground here? Great. So we have uh, Francis Cleveland uh, who just mentioned the presence of the IEC 62351 standard that has the security requirements for standards like 61850 mm -hmm. as well as others like 60870 sure. and others. So she's just reminding you to keep <clears throat> that standard also in mind uh, to make sure that the cybersecurity controls that go with the solar application remain intact. Absolutely, and, and hi, Francis. I appreciate the, the question. Uh, the SunSpec Alliance has not only working, been working on securitization, we've also been working on security. Now, one, one of the uh, uh, elements of the SunSpec standards happens to be the use of Modbus. And so Modbus is a protocol that was defined and designed in, what, 1979. So it's been around with for, for a good long time. And, uh, uh, and it has its detractors, of course, as being relatively primitive. Now, it also has its benefits of being broadly utilized. Uh, but one of, the, one of the knocks on it has been sort of a lack of, of security. And so we're working with, with Francis and others like her and, and to understand what's being pushed at the SGIP level, uh, we've, we've taken those best practices and principles and applied them to SunSpec and to Modbus. And so we're just about to put, uh, publish a security paper that talks about the best practices and standards that go into securing a SunSpec compliant uh, network. And again, informed by these, these standards that she mentioned. Another question I have is, you mentioned the variability in the 
quality of the data, yes. the granularity as well as the uh, hierarchical information that's a lot of times missing uh, in some entities but available in others. Right. How much are you doing to promote best practices in the area of data collection hmm. so that Great 10 question. years from now this is not going to be as big a problem? Great question. Uh, and it. We have a great relationship with Enroll, but I can honestly say this is a point of tension because what, what, uh, when we came to them, we said, well, hey, the way to do this is let's focus in on new plants that are going being constructed right now because if we take it in that way, we can instrument these plants from sort of the ground up using these best practices and standards that we mentioned and, so, and, having, and, and thus defining sort of a uniform set of parameters that we collect being reported in at a uniform interval. Now, because of the needs to do business now, of course, we have to bend a little bit on that, which means that we take in uh, lots of data that, don't, that doesn't live up to that standard. Now, it's, that information is useful because it's associated with operational power plants, but our confidence in that information is lower because of the factors that we mentioned. We, did, we don't know under what conditions it, it was uh, collected, and in fact, uh, we don't know if the data has been uh, manipulated, either advertently or inadvertently. And so it, that lowers your confidence, but it's still useful. But at the end of the day, the objective is to uh, raise best practices and standards so that we have uniform measurement uh, techniques. Wonderful. There is a question about the SunSpec uh, being a not-for-profit. So is that the That's case? right, yeah. We, we are a non-profit corporation. Now, for those of you from well, even those in, in, inside the United States may, may not know this, but certainly outside of the United States they wouldn't. There are various types of nonprofits, and we happen to be uh, organized under uh, 503C6 of the IRS code, which is for trade alliances. This is opposed to a charity, which is a C3. So we're not a charity. So, uh, and what that means is member dues are not tax deductible. Now, it's a normal business expense. Again, we operate for the benefit of the mem members, and our objective here is to grow the size of the market for, for these members. The, the presentations will be made available to all the attendees who are registered, as well as I'll get the roster from Gary for the people who are here, so you'll all receive those presentations. Sereni from uh, Maryland asks, it's not written here, but I know he's in Maryland. Okay. Uh, I can see this model as propelling itself into a CDO vehicle that caused the housing meltdown in 2008. Ah. How are you planning to avoid this for this industry? Credit default obligations. Okay, great. You know, actually, on, on this, uh, the, the interview on Green Tech Media uh, on this topic, most of the comments were like that, okay? And uh, I think that's, that's uh, perfectly apt. Now, what I'll point out is securitization is a well-proven mechanism for raising capital, and it's been applied for to, across a, a broad variety of, of different industries, uh, railroads, uh, cell towers, uh, you know, of course, the home mortgages, which, you know, which caused the debacle of 2008, uh, but also student loans, et cetera. And like it, as, as with uh, any mechanism, it can be manipulated. But now, how do you prevent sort of that, that manipulation? Well, through transparency. And that's why we think that the, uh, the performance information is, is so critical here. Uh, like yes, Matthias? Like There's a question here from the room, and we'll repeat the question. Yes. I actually like to comment on that rather than posing a question. This is one of the semantic uh, fallacies of uh, calling it securitization. Securitization, as it was understood in the context of the 2008 market crash, is the exact opposite of what we are attempting to do here with the SunSpec Alliance. Securitization was a means of obfuscation of data, and we are doing exactly the opposite of, of securitization in that context. So yeah, the, the comment from the audience was that the, the market meltdown in 2008 was largely caused by the fact that the information was obfuscated. Uh, it was hidden from view. The, the risks were actively covered up. And the objective of this project is to do the opposite, is to put the facts on the table available for everyone. And so it certainly is, well, so first of all about securitization, it's not the only method by which solar will be financed. It is one of the methods. 
Uh, we do think it has a, a, a good chance to, to be a successful vehicle, again, because it, we can operate trans, transparently and basically prove that the, uh, uh, the business proposition works over a long period of time. I think a very simple model to use here would be like when you go and buy a, tires for your automobile. Mm -hmm. You take these tires and they say it's 30,000 rated for 30,000 miles, 60,000 miles and so on. And the reason why they're able to say that, and then they put a bunch of caveats that you have to drive like this and, and all of that, is because in testing in labs, statistically they find to about 90% confidence or 95% confidence that the tires last that long. And the other 5% that doesn't make it, they charge that extended warranty thing or they add a little to the price to compensate for it. So we've seen this model working quite well, and then people have a certain level of confidence and they buy. Now, there was no lab in which solar panels were being put and tested. However, what they're doing by extracting the data from existing facilities is essentially taking the lab concept at a national level and bringing that data, refining it and normalizing it, removing the anomalies from it, and then using it statistically. Matthias. Yeah, so, yeah, I just have one more remark that there, um, there, there may be many different derivatives of this level of securitization. And what you just mentioned is a technical derivative, you know, let's say of the second order. And that is that you take an individual component and you apply uh, scientific and statistical means to securitize that particular part of it. That could be the case for a solar panel, uh, which were, which we would, for example, do the SCRE, would do that on top of that. It is not a replacement for it, but it's a supplementary means that provides statistical evidence over time, and hopefully over a long period of time, we arrive at a higher level of confidence. And that's the whole objective of doing this, to make the data compatible to each other, comparable to each other, and make it last over a long time. Well, be careful, component, be careful. So for the sake of the people in the audience, we'll have Tom just kind of summarize what Yeah, Matthias well, to, to, then that was Matthias Heinz of, of to Vreinland uh, making those comments. Uh, what, what he mentioned is that this type of, of information can be used in many different financing contexts, and many different securitization contexts. Here I focused in on the securitization of buy-sell contracts with regard to uh, primarily residential uh, solar operations, but what Matthias mentioned is as a, a second order application of this information, you could well imagine uh, securitization for a particular manufacturer that makes a, a certain kind of a, a, a panel where you have uh, collected information over some number of years that again gives you the confidence to believe that that panel is going to continue to uh, operate and work throughout its lifetime, which then of course with the empirical data lowers the risk associated with that investment. And, and makes that type of a buy sell or that investment uh, possible. Very good. And from Paul Denning, we have a comment that says PV Evolution is a panel testing lab in California. Yes. Yeah, there are many different uh, uh, testing organizations. Okay. And very good. <laughs> Paul, and, and Paul, if you're from uh, PV Evolution, hey, please drop me a line. Love to talk to you. Uh, say hello to Jenna. For <laughs> <laughs> okay. I have another question. And that is that uh, you mentioned correctly that you had to somehow collapse the object model of 61850 right. to fit like Modbus and other models that you were speaking of. Right. I was also thinking that wouldn't this be a good exercise to uh, go to that priority action plan within the SGIP 2.0, not yet, the 2.0 where they're mapping 61850 objects to SIM because the financial side of the business would mm -hmm. most probably in utilities and service providers look for a SIM-like object model to make reports. Mm -hmm. So it's good that you're using 61850 to generate the data mm -hmm. because it's field equipment after all. Mm -hmm. But wouldn't that uh, mapping help spread this to a much bigger plane, given how much effort is being put on SIM also? Um, 
Possibly. Now, I'm not I'm not an expert on SIM nor on the inner workings of SGIP. Now, my partner John Nunley certainly is. Okay. Uh, as I as I mentioned, he's on, on the board there. Now, unfortunately, I don't think he can speak here today. Uh, one thing I would like to say, though, is that as a trade alliance, we do the things that our constituents ask us to do. And what they've asked us to do at this point is to help them out in the commercial, industrial, uh, residential marketplaces, and which, are, which is really sort of the, the main activities for, for most of these providers. Now, again, we have lots of different types of, of, uh, of constituents in our organization from huge multinational companies to startups. Uh, but uh, I, so I guess I'll de defer on this question about uh, applying this in the utility space, but we'll be happy to follow up with you. Ah, so Frances adds because she has been active in this space. Okay. She says there's no direct mapping between SIM and IEC 61850, but the interactions are being worked on in the IEC. Okay. All right. Very good. Yeah. You Thank you, Frances. You stumped me, though. Other questions from the room um, and those who are online, please go ahead. We still have time. Any other questions for either Gary or Tom? Bert. Yes. Uh, how do you distinguish yourself from the Solvatech organization? Ah, okay. The question is how do I distinguish uh, the SunSpec Alliance from SolarTech? Well, we're two completely different organizations, uh, but we are partners. As well, SolarTech is a partner. In in fact, uh, you know, I, I operate uh, my own company, and I have a contract with SolarTech. I run a Sunshot initiative called Solar 3.0, which is focused in on standardization in the areas of soft costs. So this is in areas of of financing and uh, uh, well, all those elements that go into a power plant that aren't a nut, bolt, screw, or a panel, right? So the installation, labor, the interconnection processes, and so forth. So we work with them very closely on all areas of standardization. We have a deep expertise in terms of the IT aspects, whereas they tend to focus more on process. Are you also covering the power purchase uh, The question are, is, are we covering power purchase agreements? Now, within this initiative, the uh, uh, solar access to public capital, certainly that is a major initiative, is to standardize those purchase contracts. You know, as I mentioned, in the workshop that will be held tomorrow, I fully expect that the majority of the time will be spent on that topic of doing a page turn of where do we stand in terms of developing standardized contracts. Sir. Jamal. On, on these uh, parameters you mentioned, are they being mapped or considered with the smart energy profile? I assume that uh, utilities would be interested in some of these parameters. Yeah, the question is, are, do the parameters map to smart energy profile? And yes, they are a smart energy profile. The SunSpec Alliance Inverter model is, in fact, the model utilized by Smart Energy Profile 2.0. And so, and, and in addition to that, of course, the uh, the abstract data models can be pushed over the, uh, of course, the Zigbee transport or any other transport as well. But yes, they're functionally they are the same as SEP 2.0. Yes, that's correct. Same mnemonics. I think one of the points to think about is that the direction that we are headed with renewable energy becoming a bigger and bigger percentage of the overall energy mix is that we have to remove all of these structural impediments to making wind and solar and storage, even energy storage, because that's kind of like your dance partner to Absolutely. solar. Yep. We need to remove these impediments. Some of them are regulatory impediments, some of them are economic, and some of them are technological. But I would submit that technology is the least of the problem right now. It seems to be more on the money side and on the regulatory side to make it, I mean, I have seen subsidies and things like that, mm -hmm. but I'm talking about a sustained plan, you know, for 20, 30 years. What is the long-term outlook? So what is the SunSpec Alliance doing in terms of creating sustainability in the solar business? Mm, no, that's a really great question. Um, but before I answer that, I will say that this, the, the industry operates or presents great opportunity to everyone for the reason that it's very messy right now. I certainly agree that the, the, the risks associated with technological standardization rank probably the lowest on that list. 
but it's still um, a big problem yeah. because of the siloed approach that the industry has taken. Mm -hmm. So in terms of, of providing you know, sustained, sustainability and resilience, um, gee, I can't think of a better way to do that than open standards. And, and uh, my partner, John Nelly and I, we got our training, of course, doing a lot of internet protocol development. And so a lot of the philosophies and the licensing agreements and so forth are based upon that experience. I mean, anything that our group produces, you know, we, we, produ we produce it in the context of the SunSpec Alliance where we're collaborating with each other. But when we're done, we publish on, on the open internet and we make it available for free. Right? So how you build resilience is by pushing these open standards into the marketplace, lowering the adoption barriers, you know, thereby allowing us to agree on the things that we can and should agree on, which is how to communicate with one another, and focusing on these, these higher order issues. So I'd say that would be my answer in terms of adding resiliency to the marketplace is through standardization, open development, transparency, again, a big aspect of this. Uh, this, this solar access to public capital issue is to make all the data openly transparent, meaning that anyone who inter is interested to evaluate the risk should start by downloading the specification to see what measurements do we actually collect, what comparators are we making, and then check that against the data that's coming out of the given plant. All right, so that, that's how I think we build, you know, give this, uh, give some structure to the marketplace. Just to um, provide the audience a sense of proportion, we have about a thousand gigawatt electric at the peak mm -hmm. today in the U.S., and about seventy some percent of that is coming from a combination of coal-fired plants and nuclear plants. If even we wanted ten or fifteen percent reduction in that because of environmental reasons and other issues, imagine how many solar farms and wind farms we would have to replace it with. So this is why these economic and regulatory impediments need to get out of the way, because this is not going to remain a hobby that you do on the side when you have lots of money. Sure. Yeah, and one of the key regulatory impediments in place today are interconnection rules. And uh, I, I, I assume that it's things operate similarly around the world. It's been, a, it's been probably you know, eight or nine months since I've been out of the country, so I don't suspect things have changed that much. But certainly in the United States, the interconnection rules are the biggest, single biggest issue that constraining the, uh, the growth of the marketplace. Uh, the utilities, I think, are, are rightly concerned that these intermittent power resources are, could add some variability to their load. Certainly they're going to do that. And that's why I think that adding the control element here is so important. In fact, uh, you know, initially the, the concept was, well, we'd add control element to, to solar, and so therefore we'd be able to sell, you know, ancillary services. But, you know, equally valid is the concern that the solar industry needs to adopt control as a defensive mechanism to make sure that they can keep selling into this grid. Uh, because if with, with control, of course, then that, that's, a, you know, that's a, a key linchpin technology for adding storage and so forth and for essentially dampening the effects and moderating the effects of putting distributed energy into the power grid. So it's also it's a way of actually mitigating the level of investment that has to go in the smart grid by adding these control elements. Okay, now for the entertainment portion of this seminar. We have several utilities folks who are sitting online. Uh -huh. You are an advocate for solar power. And distributed generation in and particular. And distributed generation. Yeah. And, you know, wind power will kind of tag along with you because it is also the same kind of concept of a paradigm shift in part, relying on renewable. Part of the mix, and I think actually solar best friend is, is probably natural gas. Okay. So now for the entertainment portion. Microgrids mm -hmm. are a key enabler sure. for renewable energy. Mm -hmm because they have a way of levelizing the modulation that can occur in voltage and frequency and so on, mm -hmm. and provide clean energy into the grid because you can average it out over many assets that may exist in a microgrid. Right. So for the folks from the utility industry, what would you advise them? How should they approach their public utility commissions so that microgrids are seen as a friend and not an adversary? Really great question, and I, I can't profess to be uh, an expert on, on uh, you know, 
grid policy. But I, what I can do is share a few anecdotes. Uh, how has is, how is the San Diego Gas and Electric dealt with this issue and how they brought in microgrids? Well, in their particular case, they have a part of their, of their grid that's at the far end of a feeder line. And uh, for some historical reason, they got stuck with that, that feeder line and the power's intermittent, doesn't work very well. So essentially what they've done to mitigate that is they've built a microgrid out at the end of that line. And they've studied the results, found out, yep, customer service is way better, and actually uh, puts them in a, in a better position to, to grow out their, their service map in that area. But I would say, you know, from a, just a pure technological point of view, is get involved in some of these projects. Now, I know that, um, you know, the utilities across the country are pioneering some of these techniques and operating quite a bit with the, uh, uh, with the Navy, uh, for example, the, probably the, the strongest proponent of smart grid technology, or excuse me, of uh, microgrid technology right now is the Department of Defense. They consider it to be a mission critical type of issue. And what I see happening is that these joint projects that are being operated on by the local utility that's closest to the base, for example, and, and, uh, and that military base, is that they're using them as, as test, test beds to really understand the, the effects. And they're able to build a ROI case. So we have another question here internally. Yeah, I, I, would, I would think, Elfant, if I can add to the issue of microgrid, there is one element uh, that uh, you alluded to, and you mentioned the, um, the being a good friend of the network issue of renewable energy. And that is that we don't want to introduce additional instabilities onto the network by having renewable energy providing a very instant uh, and uncommanded response. And inherently, one thing that we have to recognize is that microgrid has one feature that is inherently different than everything else, and that is islanding. Because most of the resources that we currently employ uh, in terms of renewables are forced to anti-island when there is a grid event. Those introduce additional instabilities into the network when they occur because that's what happens in some of the incidents that we have seen across the world. And I'm not just speaking about the United States, but really, you know, from Germany and Italy and so forth. Mm -hmm. So the, so the anti-islanding feature that the conventional renewable energy resources have is actually detrimental to grid stability. Whereas <coughs> with a true microgrid and the regulatory regimen allowing that, and us with this, this is part of the providing data type of, uh, type of additional argument that we can bring into the discussion. By having these islanding provisions available to microgrid, we can introduce stability into the network. And that's, I think that is a critical issue. That we so for the people online, Matthias just provided us quite a detailed explanation about the benefits of microgrids and how it can alleviate some of the problems that exist today when the voluntary islanding is not occurring. And it leads to a lot of these uh, domino effect type uh, instabilities that we've seen in recent failures. So uh, I'll give Tom an opportunity to. Well, I, I think Matthias really captured it, uh, you know, spot on, which is that the uh, the, the current regulations, at least in the United States, which is if there's any instability, disconnect, boy, that's horrible, right? Because you can, you can imagine whole hate neighborhoods saying uh, something bad happened, let's shut off. So you just have this, this careening, slamming effect of loads coming on, loads coming off, right? So there obviously has to be a, a better way to do that. This is going to re require a, a change to the, the regulations, of course, but this is, there's very active discussions taking place in all areas of the world where we have high penetration. Those first conversations that got started up in Germany, they migrated to Italy, they've now come to California. It's a very, very hot topic right now. So I fully expect that we're going to see smart inverters, you know, coming online and a new standard to test against them. Now, certainly within the next year, we're going to have to see some of these pilots or come up online. Yeah. So we are witnessing a very interesting evolution in our market. Uh, there was a IT meltdown that exist, that occurred before the smart grid technology took off. And what that did was 
it migrated a lot of IT-focused people into our industry. And so there was a lot of emphasis on cybersecurity and having all the appropriate controls because that was the culture that they brought with them. Mm -hmm. But now that we have reached certain concepts with the NIST 7628 and, and uh, the Department of Homeland Security with their industrial control systems and then the DOE NESCO, NESCOR project, mm -hmm. we have cybersecurity galore. I mean, you name the use case and we've got the controls and there are standards bodies busy mm -hmm. filling out all those details. Mm -hmm. And I think that's wonderful. But the baby that got thrown out with the bathwater is grid stability and grid resiliency and reliability because at the end of the day, those electrons have to move on the wire with the right voltage in the right frequency with the right phase in order for these systems to work. So it seems like we, it's like Kellogg's Corn Flakes taste it again for the first time. We're coming back to the Kirchhoff's laws and the Ohm's law to make sure that they stay in line with all the cybersecurity controls because the tragedy that would occur is that we have the best crypto engine in place, the best authentication schemes and all that at the application layer, but we have a system that is, is inher not inherently, inherently un unstable. <laughs> <laughs> and no matter how fast the network is trying to control it, if there is an instability that will grow in time, we all know who have studied any double E know what happens to it. So I'm really glad that we're having these discussions because those two areas of expertise need to peacefully coexist and mm -hmm. one feeds the other. That was the point. I yeah, absolutely, and, and I'm very confident that the industry is addressing this issue because it's, a, it's an existential question, right? The industry can't continue to grow unless we solve this problem. And it's not as if this technology or these techniques to add stability to the grid are unknown. They're very well known. They just haven't been applied. But I think you're going to see a lot of innovation in this space over the coming year. Yes. So Francis makes a point, says microgrids are just a way of managing distributed energy resources. sdg and &E, as well as the other California utilities are very active with the CPUC and CEC to increase the capabilities of these DER systems. And that was exactly my point, Francis, that I'm thinking beyond California. I, I think of that little U, inverted U in the middle of the country, where <laughs> smart grid seems to be a virtual concept. Uh, that we need to move in this direction of a distributed energy resources because the challenge is if you look at the schedule of plants that are going to come offline, whether it's coal plants or nuclear plants or even some hydro plants, I'm worried about the base load. You know, how are we going to meet that base load 10 years, 15 years down the road? Uh, we are, we've got a little respite now because of the slowdown in the economy. But that's all going to change. Yeah, and Mike Cristobal says that, that uh, natural gas is going to fill a big part of that, uh, that void. Now, there's some challenges, obviously, with natural gas. It hasn't been used for baseload. Uh, it hasn't been used at the, at the utilization rates. In fact, it has to double its utilization rate uh, in order to replace coal. Uh, but it, that seems to be sort of the front runner with natural gas as a baseload and then renewables uh, to top it off. Yeah, so technologically, natural gas has the capability, but when you look at the percentage of the operational cost, that's the fuel costs, and then you see the volatility that is projected going forward with China and India and Brazil and all these countries consuming larger and larger amounts of natural gas, uh -huh. even though it's an indigenous source from an extraction perspective, its prices are not going to be controlled by just the U.S. market. Ab absolutely, and that's why we certainly hope it's a transitional fuel well, where we move to other forms of storage that you combine with, uh, with renewable energy uh, to fill some of this void. But again, I think it's, I really do agree with all of the above. It's because we have a very large appetite for, uh, for energy in this world. And, uh, you know, and solar can, can fill a big piece. It can fill a much bigger piece than I think that people are giving it credit for. Yeah. And for those of you in the audience who are thinking that this, presentation is just a promotion of solar power. That's not the case. What we're trying to do here is talk about the mechanisms by which solar power can be enabled 
in a much bigger way than it is today. In much the same way, wind power and other forms of energy are finding their mechanisms to be in the market. And we'll have presentations on those other sources of energy too. There is no panacea here, except for conservation. I think that's a good panacea. Everyone can practice that and just uh, delay the inevitable, which is energy shortages. And my concern, having coming from a third world country where we've seen four, six, eight hour outages, is that after a while it becomes a way of life and people start living around it. But when you're living in an industrialized society like ours, where we're so dependent on electricity, four or six hour outages can have a significant impact on the quality of our life. And it'll take a while before people get used to it. So I have, uh, <laughs> I have another uh, point here um, from Francis Cleveland says, cybersecurity for DER, uh, I'm developing a document in NESCOR and for the SGIP 2.0 for the distributed renewable generation. So uh, there is work going on, uh, which is very important because of the physical access uh, to these devices. Sure. So you've got to have the appropriate security controls in place with the alarming capability in case there's some tampering going on. Uh, but our focus today was not about protecting the asset as much as it was extracting the data, yeah, uh, enabling that. access to it. So I want to make a, a point about you know the subject matter here. Yes, of course, it's been applied to solar, but of course the, all these uh, control mechanisms and so forth, shaping load curves and so forth, this can be applied to any type of energy resource. So this is this talks about the the operating system, if you will, uh, for the grid, and you can you know put any types of, of storage or loads or what have what have you, and manage them really in close to the, the very same way. You have to make of course accommodations for the particular aspects of of the of the uh, generation source, but they have more things in common than not in common. Very good. Uh, now we have Mike Borton here, and I didn't want to end this without having him say a few words. If you could come here, Mike, yeah, sure. and sit here, and we'll talk a little bit about testing and certification because that's the, something that's very near and dear to your heart. So the question I have for you, Mike, is give us an idea about the current status of testing and certification for the Smart Energy Profile 2.0, uh, given the close proximity we have reached to commercial deployment of that technology. So um, as an organization, which is a sort of alliance of alliances, it's been uh, moved onto an organization called CSEP, which stands for the Consortium of Smart Energy Profile. They've get, been given the task as not being alliance dependent, but being applicable to any alliance that wants to join in them. And by the way, anybody, any alliance can join in CSEP and contribute to it. What they've been doing on a, a monthly basis for the last, I would say, 16, maybe 17 months is one week. In, a, in a, just about every month, the organizations have got together and they've been doing interoperability testing. And the point of interoperability testing wasn't to test each other's code. It was to see if everybody would interpret the spec in the same way. Because it's no good if you want to end up, if you end up with a spec that then goes out to multiple test houses and they each interpret the spec in a different way. So it's got to be really black and white. This is what it means. And the spec has really was finished, I would say, 18 months ago, really. The tweaks that have been going on from, from, from 18 months ago is really to see if everybody gets it. If I write this piece of code and I work with that, do I interpret that paragraph to be exactly the same as, the, as um, my, my uh, friends in this interoperability? It's been done anonymously. There's been no record of who's done well. It's not a matter of you do great, you did badly. It's a case of did you all understand the spec in the same way? We've then been generating a test harness specification and a set of picks and uh, a test plan, basically, that's consistent that can be applied to any physical layer. So they're trying to make it physical layer independence. And that's gone out to a, uh, it's gone out to for quotation for one vendor to come up with and, sit and apply it, and, and then there'll be basically one more test run through with everybody running through that test harness to see if everybody gets, gets it the same way again, and then it'll be ready for certification. 
the estimate is, is sometime, depending on the lines, because some lines have different internal procedures for when they do get the test harness, is somewhere between the third quarter and early next year when the spec and the first products will be through certification. It's been a lot of work, but it's really the objective was not to allow the products to be thrown into the field and interoperability being solved in the field. That last lesson was learned with set one dot something. A lot of stuff was thrown out there, and, and, and at the, even at the file layer, they couldn't even talk. And it took a long time to get only just a subset of the few products out there, people who had enough money and persistence to get it to work. This time, I think you're going to see a high degree of interoperability and requirement from the utility when they first wrote SEP2, they wrote in the requirements that really they don't want to have any complaints from customers. It's got to be zero. <laughs> now, I think that may have been unrealistic, but they, we've gone to the ends of the earth to actually make sure it happens this time. And it's been a lot of work. So a quick follow-up. Uh, Mike Asante, who used to be with NERC, now runs this uh, security examiner's uh, board. Uh, has developed a methodology by which people who do audits for NERC-SIP can get trained so that they do a better job of the NERC-SIP compliance work. What would you recommend for all these testing labs like DUB Rhineland? What process can they go through to qualify and be able to provide the kind of testing and certification for SCP 2.0? The one gap I see, and it's, it's it's not an obvious gap, but there is going to be a lot of different physical layers that SEP2 is going to be qualified against. Mm -hmm. Each alliance is responsible for approving the SIP2 file, the, the, the Zigbee file or the Wi-Fi file, mm -hmm. but SEP2 is an application layer. But the big challenge is I don't see yet a test house that's taken the chance to say, I'm going to test against any file. And so if you're not careful, if you've got a gateway, for instance, that Go, that has any physical layer, or you've got a thermostat that works over Zigbee and Wi-Fi, you're going to go to multiple test houses, I believe, to try and get certification both for your physical layers. I think TUV, you don't do home plug today, but if, if you did home plug, you'd have the, the three today. And by the way, I don't think it's going to stop. There are Bluetooth wants to join this, the CSEP. There is just about anything that you can think of a physical layer, as long as it moves IP, people will want to run SAP over. And so it's not going to stop with the three. Um, there are other PLC standards that are now getting their acts together and have certification processes more than just home plug. They've been added to the catalog of standards. They're going to want to join. But today, if, if you're not careful, someone's going to get a product certification. They're going to have to go to three or more test houses to get approved. So there's a point from Matthias from TUV Rhineland here. Right. But, but for, for this reason, we support the careful separation challenge is going to be, and I say to the semiconductor providers who are in this business too, the one who comes up with the multi-fi chip that does everything is going to be the winner. And they'll get everybody to go to them, so I just throw that same challenge out to the test houses. Whoever can te certify every physical layer or could also be the winner in this business. Cause yeah, I think this is a, a good topic uh, for us to forward to Rick Drummond uh, because of how he's leading that effort within NIST for uh, testing and certification, that if we could create at a national level some basic criteria for testing against various standards, whether it's be the PV inverter or the SCP 2.0 or anything in the TND side, so that you, you know, the uh, testing labs can say with some level of confidence, we've gone through this due diligence and we have received this certificate from NIST or some other entity at a national level so that there's some consistency. Mm. What do you think about that? Yeah, I agree. But anything we can do to enable us to get products out in the field that have a high degree of interoperability has got to be beneficial to this industry, because this industry might not take off if we don't have that high degree of interoperability. 
Yeah, I mean, we've seen we, it in the past with other standards. We have that every time we get a driver's license. Yeah. We have that with CBEST certification for public school teaching. I think this is a good direction to go. So we have only a few minutes left. What I'd like to do is just open it up one more time for the people in the room, because it looks like the people online have either fallen asleep or, or they have run out of questions to ask. Any final questions? I just have one. What's the definition of fleet, by the way? As you use oh, it? the question is, what is the definition of fleet as Tom was using it? Go okay, ahead. yeah. The, the fleet is used in the asset management context. So it's a large collection of a particular type of thing, as in a fleet of cars, a fleet of houses, a fleet of power plants. Okay. Uh, okay. I look, Matthias. Since we have to assist the layoff question with right. uh, with regards to that CCF uh, SE 2.0, I, I would you allude a little bit about what our uh, what the ideas were of the Sunspec Alliance with as it concerns to the physical representation, and in particular we, we obviously talked about in border because in border output is, is the literal equivalent of a of a 60 radius. Right. All right, so the question from the audience uh, pertained to physical layer support within the SunSpec Alliance. And so the SunSpec architecture has a very strict layering, right? That we have the, the data model and it gets mapped to transports. Now, as it, as it happens, we map to Modbus first because that was one of the main things that uh, is supported in industry. However, having said that, it maps uh, over uh, the Zigbee the Zigbee wireless radio or the Wi-Fi or power line or it really kind of doesn't matter. I mean, it, at the end of the day, we agree that all of these physical layer protocols are going to be used in different applications. We're already seeing it. And the SunSpec uh, standards have been applied over the full array of transports that are listed there and plus a few more in, in an experimental mode by some of our you know, partners' customers. But I think this is a, a, an extremely important architectural you know, choice or distinction here. I also wanted to mention about interoperability testing. So when the internet was getting started, of course, the, the universities across the globe provided that uh, interoperability you know, framework, if you will, right? UC, UCLA, uh, you know, University of California, Berkeley, uh, uh, Freiburg, whatever, I mean, places around the world where the way in which these protocols got wrung out, you know, before they were even released into the internal campus, right, these researchers um, made sure that, uh, that the interoperability happened at that level. So maybe that's what we need is the some functional equivalent of a smart internet, smart grid internet, um, backed up by research institutes so you can run some of these experiments. Tom, what is your email address the audience wants to know? Uh, uh, Tom at sunspec.org, S-U-N-S-P-E-C.org. Like that. that, just like that. All right, very good. Let me just post this in the chat window so everyone can see Tom at sunspec.org. That is how you reach Tom, our presenter today, and also to Gary Sorkin, I'd like to thank him for the presentation on the TUV Rhineland and their testing and certification services, especially pertaining to the Smart Energy Profile 2.0. And a special thanks to Mike for telling us a little bit about what it will take to certify products in this space of SEP 2.0 and what are some of the challenges given the multiple physical layers. Our next uh, presentation is going to be on the fourth Wednesday of April, and that is our monthly seminar at the IBM Innovation Center. I'll be sending out an announcement with the speaker once that's all finalized. I really appreciate all your participation and your wonderful questions today, especially the people here who came in the middle of their business day to attend this seminar in Pleasanton, California. At this time, I will end the recording and thank you all who are online for participating in our event today. Thank you.